I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Discombobulation, recombobulation, choir and acolyte shifting. All right, so hello. It is wonderful to see you all, and I give you greetings from the bi-diocesan convention that we just attended uh, this uh, weekend in Lansing. We had the uh, diocesan convention for the Diocese of Western Michigan and the Diocese of Eastern Michigan all put together in Lansing. And as they kept saying during the whole convention, this was our second convention uh, as a joint convention, but it really felt like the first because the first one that we did last year was online only. And uh, so it was Debbie and Carla and I think Deacon Wendy, you were, where did you go, Deacon Wendy? Oh, there you are. <laughs> it's like, where's Waldo? Uh, but in green. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't remember if you were with us also. Were you there? Ah, yes. So it, it was all virtual and in the parish hall. So it didn't feel like we were really together, even though we were all together as two dioceses combining together uh, to do uh, some of the work of the church. Uh, so this Friday and Saturday, uh, we were in Lansing and we were actually there in person um, with masks and we had to have our, our vaccination card or a COVID test. I mean, there was a whole process to get in to be as safe as possible because as we know, COVID is not quite done with us yet. Uh, but it was a joy to be together with everyone, and I send you greetings from that convention, uh, from uh, both dioceses, and also from our newly elected uh, Bishop Provisional, Bishop Prince Singh, uh, who uh, is now our Bishop Provisional Elect. He hasn't been installed yet, but that, we'll get to that later. But it's always funny when we get together in groups like this because you get to see how other people do things, even in your own tradition. Uh, because we think of the Episcopal Church as being really consistent, right? We have the Book of Common Prayer, not common like low and unfancy, but common like we have it in common. And we have the 1982 hymnal, and we all know our favorite hymns, and I mean, some of this stuff, you know, of course, now I have a tablet with our, our bulletins online, uh, so I don't um, have the, the written out music, but you know, I can sing alto along because I know a lot of these hymns from a long, long time ago, right? But then you get into a room with a bunch of other people from your tradition and you find out that we still don't do everything the same way. I don't need to find a Presbyterian or a Roman Catholic to find uh, diversity within Christianity. Uh, there's plenty of that already in my own denomination. It was very funny being in our, um, our worship services and finding out who bows at the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit like me and who doesn't or who's used to actually reading along in the bulletin to make sure that we don't say a word wrong here or there. Uh, and sometimes you can find that when you go outside of your denomination as well. Whoever has been caught out at a Roman Catholic wedding at the end of the Lord's Prayer because we have, you know, um, uh, for, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for the, and then nobody else says for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then you kind of shrink a little bit because you did it wrong. Well, all of these differences are really not important differences, but we tend to kind of hang our hat on it. We tend to say, well, this is how I'm unique or special, or God forbid, this is how I'm better. <laughs> and we're kind of landing in a situation like that in our gospel reading today as well. We hear this scribe show up and ask Jesus a question. 
Now, this introduction of the scribe is a little different than other situations where scribes come and ask Jesus stuff. Uh, in this case, what's prompting the scribe is not a desire to, to show off or put Jesus down. Um, what he is actually pulling him into this conversation is a different sort of, of problem. We see one of the scribes came near and heard the Sadducees disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked, and he goes on, well, what was happening right before then was the Sadducees had showed up and they were trying to quiz Jesus. And they were quizzing him with these really like involved, confusing questions. Specifically, this uh, event was the, the hypothetical of a woman who was married to a man and then that man died, leaving her childless. And by uh, the Jewish tradition and law of that day, she would become the wife of his brother. And the Sadducees, who don't believe in resurrection, are posing this ridiculous scenario where this happens to this poor woman, not just once, but seven times. She ends up marrying seven brothers and is childless at the end of each uh, 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 relationship as it, it, it ends when the husband dies, and then she eventually dies, and they want to know, okay, Jesus, you're so smart, and you say there's a resurrection, so who does she belong to now when she's resurrected? And Jesus says, you have no clue how resurrection works. So you just, your question is showing how ridiculous you are. And they have this conversation about this, that, that when you are resurrected, you're like the angels and people are neither given uh, or are neither married nor given in marriage. And that is what is happening right before this conversation, where the Sadducees are digging so deep into the details of these laws and traditions that they're completely missing the point. So the scribe shows up and says, okay, Jesus, well, what is the main point? Why are we here? What is the most important law? And Jesus says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the scribe is impressed because Jesus is able to boil this down to the most basic, the most concentrated, the most important thing that we're all supposed to remember. Love of God and love of neighbor. And that everything else is supposed to point back to those two truths, which are really just one truth, loving God. And we find that so important as Episcopalians that if you're in the right one service like we did at 8 o'clock, you know, we pray that or read that every Sunday. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two, um, uh, uh, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. That's so important that we pray that every Sunday. And the rest of it is window dressing. The rest are supposed to be details about how we're supposed to love God and love neighbor, not to become the thing in itself. Now, the problem with people is we love to be right. At least I do. Maybe, you're, maybe you don't love being right. Maybe you're unique and special and better than I am. But I love to be right, and more importantly, I hate to be wrong. I could be neutral, but if I'm wrong, oh, I just that drives me nuts. Uh, we, we had a, a moment in the Eucharist yesterday. We had the diocesan convention Eucharist. And we used a, uh, um, an approved version of the Nicene Creed that we started to do here um, a little bit before COVID happened, um, but we would use it occasionally, about once a month. And it's the one where it takes out 
uh, the, the filioque clause uh, it talks about the Holy Spirit uh, proceeding from the Father and the Son. The and the Son part is that filioque. That, um, it's, it's a long story, but we're, we're uh, discussing changing that wording around. And I was praying the creed with my eyes closed like a good Episcopalian who has it memorized. And we got to that spot and I was like, ah, I hate it. <laughs> Um, but, of course, who was also uh, looking around at the confession to see if anybody, you know, we were in a conference or a big ballroom, we, you know, we weren't in a church. So, you know, who, who wanted to make sure who was doing a profound bow at the confession? Because at the confession, you're supposed to kneel because you're sorry, right? And if you can't kneel, then you bow. That this, is a, this is a profound bow. It's the standing equivalent of kneeling. And did I have my eyes open a crack just for a moment to look around and see if anybody else was bowing? Yeah, I did. <laughs> because you know what? I love God and that's why I bow. But I also love feeling like I'm right, so that's why I look around. Because I'm a fallen, broken, sinful human being like the rest of you, right? These situations remind us what we're actually supposed to be here for. That we're actually supposed to be here to love God and love neighbor. And the rest of it is not as important. Yes, it's helpful that you're all sitting right now and no one's doing cartwheels down the center aisle. Although at the 8 o'clock, sometimes we have some kids that get really excitable. It's helpful for the sake of order that we tend to do the same thing at about the same time. But is it actually the most fundamentally important thing? It actually isn't. Now, don't quote this to me later when you want to sit, you know, on top of the altar. <laughs> but generally, we're here to love God. We are here to love our neighbor. And when we get tied up in the details of the how so much that we become unloving, we're completely missing the point. And when we miss the point, we also miss out on new experiences, on some, some strange different blessing that God had in store for us that we wouldn't have encountered if we had done everything the way we thought we were supposed to. Look at this reading from Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. Moabites were a no-no. You were not supposed to mix with them as a good Jewish person. That's in the Bible too. Don't mix with them, don't eat with them, don't marry them, God forbid. Well here, Naomi's sons married these Moabite women. They weren't supposed to do that. Well, what happened next? Eventually, Ruth becomes part of Naomi's family. And eventually she it becomes an important person. She's in the lineage of Jesus. How wonderful is that? This is all part of who we are supposed to be. People who are willing to listen to God enough to take a risk. People who are connected enough with our main purpose of love that we are willing to be surprised. Has God surprised you in your life? Maybe by acting in a way that you weren't expecting God to or presenting to you a situation you weren't prepared for? God's done that plenty for me. I'm here because of that. You know, um, we, we were talking a while ago about how I separ uh, celebrated my 10th anniversary. This was I think two Sundays ago, maybe three Sundays ago, we had our 10th anniversary uh, in ministry together. When I graduated seminary, there were lots of statistics about women in ministry, particularly how women priests tended to be assistants and they tended to serve small congregations that couldn't afford full time. And as a new seminarian coming out of seminary, ready to go out into the world, I promised myself that I would never take a, a part-time position because I felt it was my responsibility uh, on behalf of women priests everywhere not to settle 
for part-time. I had to go out and represent. And that worked well for two years as a curate, which was you know, pretty typical for a new seminarian to go be a curate or assistant someplace. And then that curacy ended and I was looking around, interviewing all over the country. And then I found this little church in Marshall that was three-quarter time. And we fell in love with each other, I'd like to think. And I took a leap of faith, and you took a leap of faith. As I, if I remember correctly, originally the position was listed at half time. So you stepped up to three-quarter time, and I stepped down to three-quarter time. And here we are, ten years later. God surprises us. And sometimes we have expectations about how things work, or even we have expectations about what God wants, and it turns out that we're wrong. And if we're willing to admit that and f be flexible and move, something amazing can happen, something like 10 wonderful years and counting. This is not a goodbye sermon. <laughs> God loves you so much, so thoroughly, so deeply, so completely, that you don't need anything more to go out and love the rest of the world. And God loves the rest of the world so much that the rest of the world doesn't need more for you to love it. We don't have a checklist. We don't have a list of rules that we need to follow as a prerequisite for that love. That love is already yours and mine. So, Let's remember that foundation. And we can giggle when we find that we're different. We can, God forbid, celebrate our differences, see how our differences are evidence of God's love and inventiveness and flexibility, see how, how our differentness complements each other and not use it to, to beat each other down, but to lift each other up to show that love and be an example of that love to the people out there. Because y'all are here. I, I assume you're here on purpose. You didn't just wake up and blunder in not knowing that this was a church. <laughs> but there are some folks out there that need to hear about that love too. So let's tell them. And let's not get bogged down in the details of how that love works, because honestly, we have ideas, but we don't really know. We don't know why uh, uh, Naomi's sons had to marry Moabite women to end up in Scripture. <laughs> but they did. And here we are, thousands of years later, talking about that story. Your story has God's love in it already. Use that to connect with others and show them that love as well. Amen.